Basically, Silicon Valley Bank in 2020 had about $60 billion in deposits. But by 20, the end of 2022, it had almost $200 billion. So the amount of cash this bank was responsible for more than tripled in two years between 2020 and 2022. Now we have to ask ourselves, why? And one of the big reasons is that tech companies, which is who Silicon Valley mostly dealt with, were under a boom during the COVID era. Think of like the Zooms of the world thriving. But the other big reason is the Federal Reserve's loose monetary policy. They were injecting trillions of printed dollars into the financial sector, and much of it ended up in places like SVB's uh, coffers. So their portfolio exponentially grew and exploded, in large part due to that easy money from the Fed. Hey guys, welcome back to The Base Brief. This week, bank bailouts 2.0, Biden's impending veto on ESG, and a long quick hits roundup. Let's jump in. All right, guys, I've had a busy weekend. My cousin was having surgery in Sandy Springs, which is near me in Atlanta. So I've had family in town all weekend. And they actually just left this morning, which I love. I love nothing more than having my family in town, but I feel like I'm kind of just coming back up for air. How was your weekend, Brad? Pretty good. We're buried in snow again here in Michigan. We had a little bit like a week of like spring like weather. And then they were like, ah, just kidding about that. So (laughs) a little depressing, not really going outside the house a whole lot, but not too bad. Can't complain. So here's how much I love my dog. I am perpetually cold all the time. You know how I feel about cold weather. We've got a portion of what you've got up there. So we've got a cold front coming through. It's like probably in the 30s here right now. And wow, I feel so bad for you. I actually do feel pretty bad for me because I it just affects my mental health. But Phoenix loves that weather because he's a snow dog. So I love him so much. I'm still letting him go out on my back patio and like keeping the door partially open so he can come in and out. And if that's not self-sacrifice, I don't know what is. It makes him so happy to be out in the cold. Wow. You are stunning and brave. <laughs> and the best dog mom ever. Yeah. All right. Well, so to kick off this week, we have to talk about the bank bailouts that are coming our way. This is a very convoluted subject that I'm very happy you had to dive into first and actually research because, to be honest, this is the kind of public policy issue that just makes my eyes totally glaze over. I hate finance to begin with. I hate Wall Street and the stock market. All that just bores me to tears. But I know that this is important, and you actually talked about this on Kennedy last night. So give us the lowdown on what happened with the bank crash and what is going to happen as a repercussion of that. Yeah, so we're going to do a deep dive on what went down with Silicon Valley Bank and more importantly, the Biden administration's response to it. Uh, And this stuff is pretty complicated. I've got an econ background, but not a finance background. So some of this stuff I'm familiar with, but some of it, um, particularly when you get into the actual investment portfolios and some of that really does go a bit over my head. So we're going to just a little malpractice alert. Uh, None of this is financial (laughs) advice and don't take any of this uh, for absolute gospel. But we're going to run through what went down, what the possible causes are and what this response is. First, to introduce the subject, take a listen to this clip from David McCormick on CNBC, followed by Susan Lee on Fox Business, because they both point out some of the big factors at play here. There's a decade of policy of excessive spending. I think the the spending by any measure has gone off the charts over the last two years. And there's more than a decade of of persistent easy money. And uh, and yeah, we should have made adjustments sooner, in in, in my opinion. But at this moment, that's created a macro environment that's very, very risky. Now, in SVB's case, I think there's plenty of blame to go around. Management, absolutely, uh, did a terrible job of managing the risk. But the San Francisco Fed has oversight here. And what happened was so obvious in the following sense. That that long duration treasury portfolio they had combined with a concentrated base of depositors who all are, are gonna be challenged in this environment. There was definite mismanagement because he also paid out bonuses, thousands of dollars in individual bonuses just a few hours before declaring bankruptcy on Friday morning. Also this mismatch, where was the risk management in this uh, bank? It's been around for 40 years. How did you not know that when you work in venture capital that a lot of your depositors need their money back in a short term? So why would you plow 20 billion dollars up to 70 billion dollars into these longer dated maturities of treasuries which you can't cash out until 10 years later 
So I'm going to try to break down what you just heard there and, and put it in as simple terms as possible, right? SVB collapse for dummies. Basically, Silicon Valley Bank in 2020 had about $60 billion in deposits. But by 20, the end of 2022, it had almost $200 billion. So the amount of cash this bank was responsible for more than tripled in two years between 2020 and 2022. Now we have to ask ourselves why. And one of the big reasons is that tech companies, which is who Silicon Valley mostly dealt with, were under a boom during the COVID era. Think of like the Zooms of the world thriving. But the other big reason is the Federal Reserve's loose monetary policy. They were injecting trillions of printed dollars into the financial sector, and much of it ended up in places like SVB's uh, coffers, so their portfolio exponentially grew and exploded in large part due to that easy money from the Fed, um, which put them in the situation where they had tons more money than they expected and had to invest it somehow. Are you tracking me so far, Hannah? Yeah, I'm tracking you so far. And I have to say no sympathy yet, because while this is over my head, you're a bank. Your one job is to know how to manage money and to be able to take on more money and invest it wisely. And as dumb as I am when it comes to finance, I literally source this out. I pay people to manage my money for me because I know it's not my strong suit. I would know starting in 2020 when the government starts pumping the economy with money, when they start keeping interest rates artificially low, that there's going to be inevitable blowback from that and would start taking precautions. And it seems like they did the opposite. They really did. That's a very good point because they had all this money to invest and they did so foolishly. Now, I want to be clear because people will call us corporate shills. We are not going to be defending SVB in this podcast. There's a lot of mismanagement, including them like taking bonuses right before this went down um, and selling <laughs> of off course. stock. It's like there's some corrupt stuff that went on here. Um, but back to this mismanagement question. So they had all this extra money to invest from the loose monetary policy, from the tech boom, et cetera. But they decided to do so in a way that was very foolish. They tied their money up in investments that assumed interest rates would stay low and where they couldn't easily liquidate their money back. Now, interest rates didn't stay low because we got inflation, which is the predictable response of printing trillions of dollars and reckless federal stimulus policy. But they actually put their money in investments that would succeed if interest rates stayed low. The smart thing to do would have been to either hedge your bets and have a mix or bet on them going up. Uh, but they didn't do that. So what happened is that interest rates then went up. The Fed raised interest rates uh, in response to inflation. And this bank was caught flat footed. Their investments uh, were really not wisely anticipating this. And then people started to ask for their money back and take their money back from SVB. Um, but basically, it led to a good old fashioned run on the bank because some people started taking it. Other people hear that they're taking it out and no bank actually ever has enough money on hand to give all their depositors their money back at once. We have a system called fractional reserve banking, which is essentially the way that the bank works is people think of it like I put $10 in my savings account. The bank sits on my $10. That's not true. They take that $10 and they loan it out or invest it. Uh, and, and what they do is they keep enough cash on hand that if you want your $10 back, they could give it to you. But if every single person, if 100 people had bank accounts with $10, they probably might have $100 total on hand. They don't have all 100 people's $10 on hand ready to give it back. So if everyone starts asking for their money, then it causes a run on the bank and a panic because they don't have the cash. And because they tied up their investments, in longer term things that they couldn't easily liquidate and cash out, they um, were screwed and basically collapsed and had to be taken over by the uh, federal uh, deposit insurance and go into crisis mode and have the government step in here. So is this all is this all making sense so far? It is. And from my understanding, basically up to $250,000 is guaranteed at every bank per depositor. So if I have $250,000 of bank, the insurance policies of that bank are guaranteed to pay me that. And if there is a run on the bank and they're bankrupt, whatever, I'm going to get that money through insurance. That's actually, that's the federal government insures up to 250000 per Got borrower. It. 
But, but SVB bank, is a unique bank in that right. most, about 90% of their depositors weren't insured in that these were huge money accounts. They were not small mom and pop people with their savings accounts of 50,000 that would, or 10,000 that would be covered. So a lot of this was uninsured because it's, you know, $10 million from some venture capitalist or startup or something. So it's way over the FDIC insurance, the federal insurance that makes sure you'll get your money back. So a couple things to note there. We're talking, this is a lot of tech companies, a lot of venture capitalists that have way more money in the bank than the average person. A lot of uninsured risk at this point. Basically, the bank makes a lot of bad decisions. It's about to go belly up. And my inclination is that you see the government readily step in because these are their donors, right? These are big tech entrepreneurs. And and yes, the bank is at fault here, but aren't they also at fault? Because if I'm somebody who has millions of dollars and I know that the insurance is $250,000, I'm going to spread my money in accounts across multiple banks. That just seems like the obvious thing that you would do to hedge your bets and protect your own interests. And it seems that the vast majority of these people were not doing that. And we're going to come in and essentially bail out bad decision making. And the thing that I think is so infuriating about this is that if it was a poor person who made these bad financial decisions, right, what do we say to them? You need self-responsibility. You need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You need to make better decisions, right? We would never think that the the people or the government should come in and bail out people who make poor decisions when they're low income. But when you're rich, this tends to be the status quo that your friends in government rush in to save you and help you. And that is, I think, so unjust. And that is what made everybody so infuriated during 2008 when we had the original bank bailouts, because you had all these people at the top making really bad decisions, and then they don't have to pay the consequences. Instead, the rest of us have to pay for that. And that led to all kinds of political movements, such as Occupy Wall Street. It led to the Tea Party movement. And yet it sort of seems like nothing has actually changed. Well, some things have changed based on the response not being exactly the same as it was in 2008. But I first, I do want to dive into the causes a little more here. So we already discussed the Federal Reserve's role with its loose monetary policy, its sti- the STEMI, everything. Um, another one is very clearly mismanagement by SVB. And I want to talk about this because why is it that they made such reckless decisions? I think it's in part because of something called moral hazard. It's this basic concept in economics that uh, when people's actions are divorced from the consequences of those actions, they will behave more recklessly and take more risks. So for example, if the government were to pass a law saying that they will force taxpayers to pay for car repairs, no matter what, right, we'll pay for car repairs because having functioning vehicles is important for the economy, people would, you know, be much less cautious driving. They would not worry about dinging up their car when they pull out for a a parallel park or something. That's a a well-documented trend. People drive more recklessly when they have insurance on their car, for example. (laughs) Um, This is is well-documented. That's that's moral hazard. Uh, And because we completely bailed out the banks in 2008, including shareholders and investors and all these people, It basically set the stage that we can take some risks because they'll they'll catch us if we mess up, right? They will. And, and, And so I think the entire atmosphere in which the financial sector op has operated post 2008 has been additionally reckless because of that. And unfortunately, we're only going to see more of that after these interventions, but uh, we'll, we'll get into those in specifics in a moment. Um, but just uh, the moral hazard piece, does that does that make sense so far? Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. I definitely drive very recklessly and it probably is because I have insurance. So I, it tracks to me and it's, it's sort of what I said earlier. We've already seen them come out and bail out these same sort of actors in the past. I could see why they would anticipate that if they do mess up again, they're going to come bail them out again. And I think that the reason that they have that assurance is it does impact everybody, right? Like I, I can almost understand if you don't know anything about the economy, you don't know anything about finance, you would understand a bank failing and then these venture capitalists, these tech companies not being able to pay their employees. And then that can have this huge trickle effect right out into the economy. And you have the fear that other banks will then start to fail and that you'll have something that kicks into a recession into motion or even a depression into motion. And so that is where you get the urge for people to come in and say, let's just stop the bleeding. Let's bail it out. Let's let's prevent there being like a contingency effect. But I think they rest on that assurance and, and knowing that. And that is why they make worse decisions. And that's why Again, these people who are, you know, the tech leaders and, and venture capitalists, people who have the most money in our economy, 
are making really bad financial decisions at a baseline because I think they always know that they're not going to have to pay the repercussions. So the the big response from the Elizabeth Warrens of the world, uh, kind of the progressives, has been that this was caused by deregulation. And what they're talking <laughs> about, um, and what they're talking about is that under the Trump administration, there was bipartisan legislation to roll back some of the Dodd Frank regulations as applied to small and medium banks, not the big banks. The big banks were still ready, but they rolled because they were really hurting small banks and regional okay. banks. Uh, and so they rolled back some rules, including, and it gets convoluted, stuff that would have subjected them to stress testing by the Fed. Um, so there's some some legitimacy, actually, I think, to the claim that um, if under the previous regulatory regime before this change, now they're blaming Trump, but actually a lot of Democrats voted for it too. It was kind of a somewhat bipartisan move to roll back these rules because they were hurting small banks. Um, and people were hearing about it from their constituents. But if those old rules had been in place, it's possible that there would have been more stringent stress testing in play enforced on SVB and that this risk could have been caught. Um, and I actually, I don't know, I've been, I've been listening to this and I actually can't really see a big hole in their argument. Um, but I've, I've been reading up on it and even PolitiFact, uh, the experts that they quote, and that's a pretty liberal leaning uh, fact checker said like it wouldn't have stopped this you can't say that's the one factor but it might have slowed it down uh it might have given us more warning signs and i guess it's hard to say for sure um i mean i think that's the problem with regulations though is you could always say in the aftermath like if we had this regulation in place we would have known we could have stopped this one thing from happening but does that ability, ability to do that outweigh all of the cost of those regulations in the first place, right? So you have to look at it as a whole. And as you mentioned, this was something that was hurting all institutions, all small and medium sized banks that actually hurts consumers as well. So I, I never really give a lot of credence to people who start crying about deregulation. The financial sector is one of the most regulated sectors in existence. Just because one regulation got pulled back that could have maybe prevented this Maybe, maybe it could have prevented it. Maybe it wouldn't have. But as a whole, it probably would have been a lag on our economy. And really, what would actually prevent this would be to quit giving people corporate welfare and bailouts. You need to make yeah. people have to be able to fail in capitalism. That is one of the biggest components for a free market capital system to exist is that you have failure. And failure is actually wonderful in a capital system because it allows new companies to creep in, allows more innovation. It gets rid of things that are not operating efficiently. And people have to pay the consequences for their own bad decisions, which incentivizes people being smarter. As a whole in America, we don't really have that at the corporate level anymore. We have that for mom and pop shops. If you're an idiot and you run your business poorly and you go out of business, nobody's coming to bail you out. And that is the vast majority of businesses in this country. I want to be clear, most businesses in this country are still small and medium sized businesses are not corporations, but the corporations are the ones that always get the money. They get the policies crafted. They get the regulations crafted to fit their interests. And it's just very corrupt. And all of this ultimately is why you see an entire generation of people starting to turn on capitalism because they think this is capitalism. They think that the things our government is doing is capitalism and they recognize correctly that these things are immoral and wrong and backwards, but they aren't capitalism. They're actually a direct attack on it. Yeah, on the deregulation question specifically, I think, you know, maybe it would have prohibited it. I don't really know. Um, it gets pretty complicated and technical. But we we can say that the, there's always serious costs to these kinds of things. And also the regulation wouldn't have fundamentally changed SVB's investment portfolio, which was the problem. It simply might have tipped people off to it being a problem sooner. But it's like they made bad decisions and that these regulations wouldn't have changed those decisions. They just might have caught them or alerted people to them sooner. Um, and so I, I don't think it would have gotten us out of this whole mess. And and I yeah, I, I it is a catch-22. It's like, could it have? Maybe hypothetically, but then it's the, the seen versus the unseen, right? What about all the things we're not talking about, all the small banks that were being hurt by these regulations beforehand? You're just willing to sacrifice them. I don't know. It's complicated on that one. Um, but I think we can put a pin in that. I just wanted to acknowledge it because it's not like, for example, on the Ohio train derailment, a bunch of progressives were saying Trump rolled back regulations that wouldn't have even applied to the train. Right. It was like obviously absurd. This mm -hmm. case, I want to give them credit that like it's not absurd. They're actually talking about something that's a legitimate critique or concern. I don't necessarily think it's the, the root of the problem. 
But I do want to just be intellectually honest in that sense is that they're not being baseless on this one uh, in the same way they are in the past. But now let's talk about the uh, Biden administration's response to what they've done uh, in response to SVB's kind of collapse. So as we mentioned before, depositors, the people that put money in the bank, um, were already protected up to $250,000 by FDIC, right? Federal government, but deposit insurance. But the Biden administration has announced that they're going to protect the rest. They're going to step in and insure all the deposits for all the people there. It is not, however, a full bailout of the bank. Like the investors, the shareholders, uh, the executives, they're not getting bailed out. They're being allowed to fail. That is good, I think. Uh, that is a much better than the 2008 situation. So uh, take a listen to Janet Yellen, what she had to say trying to differentiate this from 2008. Let me be clear that um, during the financial crisis, um, there were um, investors um, and owners of systemic large banks that were bailed out and we're certainly not looking and uh, the reforms that have been put in place means that we're not going to do that again but we are concerned about depositors and are focused on uh, trying to meet their needs a few more details on what they're doing from nbc news the costs of covering the deposits including uninsured amounts in excess of the fdic's 250,000 limit will be paid for in part out of the agency's deposit insurance fund, a reserve that is paid for by a quarterly fee on banks. In remarks Monday morning, President Biden said taxpayers would not be on the hook for losses suffered as a result of the backstop measure. Instead, he said losses would be borne by fees paid for by banks. Funding for the emergency measures will also come from selling off SVBs assets. That is a key difference from the congressionally approved bailout of the U.S. financial system authorities approved in the fall of 2008. So I, it's complicated here. I can see some upsides to what they're doing. A lot of ways it's better than 2008, but there's also some serious downsides because I like the fact that it's not a full bailout. Um, the shareholders are going to be left holding the bag. And I like the fact that it's not directly using taxpayer money um, but if we're being honest, those fees are going to get passed along to consumers and also banks that SVB was reckless, but now other banks that weren't are going to have to pay and their customers are going to have to pay. We know that. So there is, uh, some redistribution that's going on here, whether it's direct like 2008, no, but it's still going to be an indirect bailout. Optically, they cannot get away with doing what they did in 2008 again, and they very well know it. I think this is their workaround, but the end result is basically the same. Essentially, you're making this bank's competitors, who did a better job than they did at managing their money, come in and bail them out. Because you're making them pay into this fund for years and years and years, and then you're going to take those funds and you're going to use it to bail them out. So you're right that those costs were getting passed on to consumers all along. So we are ultimately paying for it. It's also, again, immoral and unjust to make somebody's competitors pay to bail them out or pay for their bad mistakes. That is a bad incentive in a market. And I also I saw this guy. His name is Vivek Ramaswani, I believe. Are you familiar with him? Yeah. I've been following him a little bit on Twitter, but he said, if the real FDIC guarantee is some number greater than 250,000, then why play the charade of pretending like there was a cap at all? I hate this game of the government saving its darlings by bending the rules after the fact. But I guess it's kudos to Silicon Valley for winning the addition of crony capitals in America. And that's I think that's exactly what it is. I still think it's crony capitalism. I It is better than a direct bailout. It is more limited than the bailouts of 2008. But I'm not buying their PR and spin on this, that this is somehow a, a good idea or a good solution. And I think that ultimately you still have the end result being the same, which is that you are continuing to move further and further away from actual capitalist system and continuing to create a financial system in this country that is unstable. And as a you know 30 year old woman trying to plan for my future right now in this country feels impossible. And that sucks because I've been told my whole life, you work hard, you do the right thing, you you save your money, you invest, you're smart, you're diligent. And it turns out that when you do those things, you still might get screwed because of how this is operating at this point. And that is demoralizing. You know, I really do. We make fun of these people on TikTok who are crying about capitalism and it, it is absurd. 
But I do understand some of the angst and anxiety that people feel in our generation right now, because we know this is one of multiple factors going on within the economy and the financial sectors that feels like a house of cards about to come tumbling down on all of our heads. You have Social Security that's going bankrupt. It's hard to pick investments in the stock market right now because you still know that it might go belly up any minute. You have inflation that's eating up your savings. It, it really does feel like it is impossible to get ahead in this country playing by the rules. And that pushes people to want to overthrow the system or it pushes people to start bending the rules and start playing this game and say, you know what, if, if people who act like this get away with it and actually even get the handouts, like what incentive do I have to do what we try to tell people, which is to work hard? And I think that trickles into people not wanting to work anymore. I think it contributes into all kinds of societal factors that the right is really upset about and some people on the left are upset about, but they're not addressing the root causes, which is that you are messing with our money and our finances to the point where people cannot plan for retirement. They cannot plan to have families. They can't even plan to buy a house at this point because of what you've done to all these financial sectors. So I'm, I'm mad about it. I'm ready to see real leadership rise up in D.C. to start combating this and get the Federal Reserve under control. But it feels like there's just a few canaries in the coal mine up there, like Thomas Massey and Rand Paul, who are always sort of pointing out the in road of where we're heading and yet with the train just keeps spiraling and, and heading right off the cliff and it's it's very depressing at times to try to think about where we're going to be in 20 30 40 years in this country yeah so i like the point that you made about uh rewriting the rules after the fact because that's essentially what they're doing here they told everybody we will insure your deposits up to 250k above that be careful where you put them because they're not insured people weren't careful where they put them these depositors didn't really do anything wrong. It's SVB who was reckless, but they put their money in somewhere that was reckless and didn't do their due diligence, uh, which you can't really expect like a mom and pop person to really do. But these are sophisticated Silicon Valley businesses and startups and elites like they should know where they're putting millions of dollars and in what their financial portfolio is. Um, now, so I have mixed feelings about this because it sucks that they would be screwed over by this bank's incompetence, but also they should have been more responsible about where they put their money. And this bailout will exclusively help big money depositors. It's not helping anyone, you know, who's an everyday person because up to 250K is already covered. Um, and this essentially sets the precedent that now the new FDIC, FDIC limit is essentially infinity. Right. So it's no longer 250K. It's whatever. We'll insure all deposits. And th there's some real problems with that being the new precedent that that will insure a deposits no matter what. Again, moral hazard. Now we're going to bail out the deposits no matter what happens, huh? No matter where they put their money. Again, that's going to discourage people from making sound decisions, from doing their due diligence. And in fact, this is what deposit insurance does as a concept. I totally understand the urge to protect people so they can get their get their money back if they put it in a bank and the bank screws up. But it ironically, this deposit insurance system makes bank failures more likely. Let me read you something from the Wall Street Journal. Virtually every academic study of deposit insurance shows that it promotes rather than reduces banking system fragility with major costs borne by the insurers, which ultimately ultimately means by insured depositors and potentially taxpayers. The popularity of deposit insurance reflects public ignorance about its costs and about how a disciplined, uninsured banking system could operate as an alternative. That makes a lot of sense to me, even though it's somewhat counterintuitive. Yeah, and I wonder, do you know the history? When did we have these insurance limits put in place? I assume it was around the Great Depression or something. I no, I I don't. I I really don't. I know the the uh, limit has increased over time, so I think it was around the Great Depression. Actually, hold on one sec. I'm gonna find them. I I tweeted something about this. Oh yeah, you yeah. did. I saw you had like a chart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they started gone FDIC coverage, I believe, in 1934 at 2,500, and it's just slowly creeped up in over time. <laughs> uh, and by 1969, it was 20,000. By 1980, it was 100,000. By 2008, it was raised to 250,000. And now in 2023, it was raised to infinity, is what the meme says. But it seems accurate, right? Because what are they going to do? Say, oh, no, that was one time thing just for SVB. Like, no, now they're going to have to insure all deposits, you'd think. Somebody exactly. replied to my tweet and said, the slippery slope doesn't exist. 
<laughs> like, it clearly it does. So now we're on the hook for full deposit insurance, and that's going to encourage more recklessness, uh -huh. more disregard, lack of due diligence, not less. And again, for who? The wealthy. And I think that this is a point I will give to the left. I will give to people who are mad about cap about capitalism. I think they're wrong about the true enemy, which is the government, not capitalism. But that is something that is going to increasingly uh, further the class divide, is going to further animosity amongst Americans. And it's not right because we do not bail out middle income people. We don't bail out poor people. We come in and bail out the rich. And that is why I think we increasingly are under an oligarchy type system more than an actual capitalist free market system where the, the wealthy are in bed with government, the big corporations are in bed with government, and they're both working for each other and not for you. You don't actually really have that much representation anymore. All right. Well, that's our take on the whole SVB situation. We did our best with it. It is super complicated. Uh, we'll keep following that story. Hopefully it stays kind of condensed. I don't think it's going to spread to other banks because they don't have the, the same high risk portfolio as SVB. Um, but let, we'll have to see. And I will say I don't have a ton of faith in the people who are in charge of all this right now. <laughs> but uh, speaking of the people who are in charge, President Biden is vetoing some uh, controversial but important legislation. Right, Hannah? That's right. It has a lot of overlap with the whole corporation thing that we were just talking about. So let's move into a segment covering ESG, which we've actually I don't think covered on this podcast before. So we're going to kind of give you the lowdown. Uh, essentially, there was a piece of legislation that was recently passed. This is according to reporting from Reuters, and they say a Republican bill to prevent pension fund managers from basing investment decisions on factors like climate change cleared Congress on Wednesday, setting up a confrontation with President Joe Biden, who is expected to veto the measure. The U.S. Senate voted 50 to 46 to adopt a resolution to overturn a Labor Department rule, making it easier for fund managers to consider environmental social and corporate governance, better known as ESG, issues for investments and shareholder rights decisions. You had two Democratic senators, Joe Manchin and John Tester, who voted with Republicans to pass it. And the White House has said that Biden will veto it, which will be his first veto. Uh, Republicans claim the rule, which covers plans that collectively invest $12 trillion on behalf of 150 million Americans, would politicize investing by allowing plan managers to pursue liberal causes, which they say would hurt performance. Republicans said their resolution would prevent fund managers from basing investment decisions on ESG factors primarily, but they acknowledged that it would not stop funds from considering ESG issues altogether. This just simply says that the primary criteria has to be the financial return on investment, said Republican Senator Mike Braun, who sponsored the bill. So let me put all that in layman's terms. Uh, essentially, the bill that Republicans passed applies to pension funds, which are public retirement funds that taxpayers pay for. And what they're trying to say is that when portfolio managers are deciding how to invest in order to get a return for those pensions, they have to make the actual investment return the number one priority, which you would think would be obviously common sense. That would be um, the thing you want to do. <laughs> but <laughs> shockingly enough, that is increasingly not how many of these fund managers are making their decisions on where to invest funds instead of looking at what would get the biggest return on investment for people whose money they're managing. They're instead looking at what are known as ESG factors. And this has been a growing thing Republicans and libertarians have started paying a little bit more attention to in recent years. Um, ESG basically is a term that was first used in 2004. It comes from the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment Report that was titled Who Cares Wins. And it was a joint initiative of many financial institutions at the invitation of the UN. The emphasis on ESG is increasingly growing as major institutional investors are making it clear they expect companies they hold to commit strongly on ESG criteria. And so ESG is uh, basically code for woke Marxism crap. I mean, if you start digging into what the policies of ESG are, they are the Trojan horse of the less, you know, top priorities that they cannot get past legislatively because they're just not all that popular and they don't make a lot of sense and they're really counterintuitive to what businesses and goals should be which is to make money and to deliver a product or service but they're saying um you know it doesn't matter apple how well you're providing a service that people love or the fact that you're selling lots of iphones this would probably be a good investment for our shareholders instead we want to know do you have racial equity training for your employees we want to know how many people of color are on your board we want to know how many women 
on your board. We want to know the pay discrepancy is between women who work for you versus men. We want to know what you're doing to combat climate change. These are the kinds of issues that they look at. And this is one reason you've seen like this huge thing in June during Pride Month. All these companies come out with rainbow flags and then they have all these pink products to celebrate women for feminism. And they're doing all this like virtue signaling that I, as a consumer, I'm just like, I don't need that. I actually just want to buy a good product or service. I don't care what your politics are as a company. But they're increasingly starting to virtue signal in that way because they are trying not to signal to consumers even so much, but to investors that they are woke enough and towing the line on these progressive issues in order to get them to invest their money. And so this is a pretty big problem. I'm going to pause there and get your reaction because I think this has been somewhat under the radar. But when you really start digging into it, there's many obvious problems that present themselves. Yeah, ESG is a really interesting one. It's environmental and social governance, uh, the idea as opposed to profit maximization. Uh, considering these other factors in in tandem with profit maximization. So some of it's like you said, really getting into the nitty gritty of is this business progressive enough for their values and how they operate as a business for us to invest in them. But also some of it's like categorical. For example, a, a traditional investment fund would say, what company is going to make us the best return do we think oh it's it might be coal companies all right we'll put our money there because our job is to help these people afford retirement not okay. to accomplish some social change whereas even an esg directed fund would say like even if we think coal stocks are what will maximize returns we're not going to do that we're going to put them in something else because we don't believe in that that's that's not good for the environment or something which is a total perversion of the idea of like a uh, fiduciary duty, right? Of owing to to the people that you're re representing a maximization of returns because people's livelihoods are based on this. They're counting on you to be able to retire and you want to put your own political views and priorities ahead of their financial interests. And that's part of the problem with this because while I think it's dumb, I wouldn't have so much of a problem over uh, ESG if it was just like a side option that people were choosing if they wanted. I want a woke investment fund. Okay, <laughs> I guess you're dumb, but it's a free country. Um, I have a real problem with it, though, because a lot of these, a lot of times you don't get to choose your plan, right? Mm -hmm. You're put into a pension system or you're put into a retirement option, right? It's not something where there's robust free options all the time. And so for anyone to have that pushed on them from top down, seems very wrong to me. I mean, so, so for example, Senator Mike Braun uh, says this just simply says the primary criterion has to be the financial return on investment for these public funds. Um, that seems completely commonsensical to me. Right. To be clear, they're not saying in this bill that investment funds can't take ESG into account. They're just saying that that should be secondary. And I want to roll this clip briefly by Speaker Kevin McCarthy, who actually spoke to how this is impacting everyday Americans, because you're absolutely correct. Those 150 million Americans who have public pension funds, they don't get a lot of say even in who manages their fund. Um, and that's sometimes true in the private market, too. I know at one previous employer, I had to have my 401k through Vanguard and I had you know limited options for mutual funds I could invest in. And I didn't have a whole lot of say past that how my money was getting invested. I didn't even know how they were making decisions, but likely Vanguard and BlackRock and some of these big companies are notorious for prioritizing ESG over returns. And so who ultimately is hurt are people who are trying to yet again do the right thing, invest in their retirements and are getting sidelined for a progressive agenda. So let's roll this clip from Kevin. He wants to impose his left-leaning activist views on companies and investors of how they have to choose their investments, not based upon the return of the investment, not based mm -hmm. upon the best place to put your money. And that is only going to harm. People are going to have to work longer, have less money. Uh, and then when you look at his budget, he wants to tax any money you have, <laughs> even when you haven't seen the return yet. So he's referencing there Biden's original Labor Department rule that this legislation is overturning. And that led that original rule would have let these these um, funds prioritize ESG. And I agree with you because this isn't completely free choice. People shouldn't be they shouldn't be allowed to do this with your money top down. Um, I, so. I have a feeling that. Um, the fact that, honestly, that a couple Democrats even voted for it, John Tester and Joe Manchin, because it couldn't have got through the Senate with just right. support, that says something. Like, Joe Manchin, 
okay, maybe. But John Tester, yeah. moderate, but like, why would he be breaking with them on this? There's no yeah. real political reason for him to do that. It's got to be that like normal Democrats even don't want their comp- don't want their investment funds doing this. Right. Well, when you think about people saying, I'm never going to get to retire because of capitalism, I'm going to have to work so much longer. No, you're going to have to work longer and not get to retire because this kind of thing. Biden's going to be yeah. this, to be clear. And so this is going to be uh, ongoingly how people are making their investment decisions with your retirement accounts. And I think that that it really shows um, not only that he is putting, I think, his agenda over the interest of the people, but I think it shows you a bigger problem, which is, is that this is pretty much how Democrats have decided to get their wins. They have failed to get their wins in the courts. They've been getting their butts handed to them in the court system for the past couple of decades. They did not have a strategy. Republicans had a very smart strategy to take over the courts during the 80s, and they've done it. And so the litigation strategy has dried up for Democrats to get their political wins, which had been really what they had leaned on very, very heavily since the 1960s. They've never been good at passing legislation, to be quite clear. Um, They know that they don't really have the ability to pass these things through Congress. So now they're doing this thing where they're starting to sort of weaponize capitalism uh, against the American people and and, and found a way to start putting pressure on companies to do things that don't make sense. Again, the reason they can't pass a lot of their climate change agenda is because it's absolute nonsense. It isn't even actually about the climate half the time. It's much more about progressive economic policies and taking control of the economy. And since they couldn't pass it legislatively, now they're basically trying to find this loophole to push companies to do the things they wanted them to do anyways, um, because they're, you know, using their wokeism against them. And I think that ultimately that is a a really big problem and it's going to be hard for us to get a hold of, right? Because it's not something that we can come in and overturn. It's not even necessarily something we can sue against. It's something where we're going to have to match that public pressure on companies in the reverse so that they are not inclined to increasingly uh, follow this agenda and start basically using their money and power as big companies to push the progressive agenda on the rest of the country. So that's the bigger picture to it. And I think ultimately we're already starting to see some of this where companies are getting so politicized and you see Republicans starting to turn on companies because Republicans always felt like big business was kind of their friends. And then when somebody like Disney starts pushing a lot more of uh, left wing ideology, Republicans are aghast and they're upset and they're wanting to find ways to attack Disney like Ron DeSantis in Florida recently has tried to do. And then you see in Texas, um, you know, they are kind of doing the reverse where they're starting to go after companies like JP Morgan who won't loan money or get in bed with fossil fuels. And so they're saying that's a lot of our industry here in Texas. You don't support that industry. We're going to have after you. And you're going to have the culture wars basically seep into the economy and the businesses. And that's bad for all of us. I want to play this clip that is also by Vivek Kramaswani. And I think he makes a really good point here. Asset managers should not use other people's money to pressure corporations to adopt one-sided political agendas. And that's what people miss is actually Apple's board. I'll just give you a very specific example because people miss this all the time. Apple's board did not want to adopt a racial equity audit until BlackRock and State Street used other people's money to force them to do it. So that's what I object to. But I want to go back to the point where, you know what, there's a deeper point at issue here. You know what, the private sector is where people come together, whether or not they're black or white or Democrat or Republican. That's actually what holds America together. And this conversation about a national divorce where, you know what, Gavin Newsom is saying he won't do business with Walgreens and Ron DeSantis effectively says similar things about Disney. This ought to be concerning to every American because capitalism used to be what bound us together across our ideological and identity, identitarian differences. And if that itself becomes politicized, that is what marks yeah. the beginning of the end of the Senator, American experiment Senator. as we know it. That's what concerns me. So, yeah, I think he makes a great point there. Capitalism has the ability to unite people and cooperate with strangers. But when we start enforcing ideology and political litmus tests into market decisions instead of actual profit, loss, prices, these kinds of things, it undermines our ability to do that. So, I, yeah, I completely agree. I think the ESG movement is pretty toxic. Yeah, ESG is definitely not good for anybody, but you know what is? Our quick kick segment. Let's jump in. We've got some great videos to show you guys this week. First up, I saw a completely unhinged video from your governor yesterday on Twitter, Governor Gretchen Whitmer in Michigan. They- Ugh, the best. One of the worst governors of the COVID era, if not the worst. I think it's probably between her and Gavin Newsom for who was the most. And like, Andrew Cuomo. They're like the three oh, yeah. worst. Well, Andrew Cuomo, the whole sexual assault thing, I guess he wins. But she was really bad. So um, she was confronted with some of her absolute neuroses during an interview recently. And what she had to say was super cringeworthy. Let's roll this clip. There were moments where we you know, had to make 
some decisions that, in retrospect, don't make a lot of sense, right? Um, if you went into the hardware store, if you go into the hardware store, but we, we didn't want people, you know, all congregating around the gardening supplies. People said, oh, she's outlawed seeds. It was February in Michigan. No one was planting anyway. But um, that being said, you know, some of those policies, I look back and think, you know, that what maybe was, was, a little, was a little more than we needed to do. So, Brad, I have to ask, do you typically have issues in Michigan with people just hoarding around the gardening supplies? <laughs> because that's how she makes it sound. This is ridiculous. She's basically saying, you know, were my decisions absolutely unhinged and detached from reality? Yes. Oops. <laughs> like, it's, it's so annoying to me. Yeah, it's, an, it's also factually incorrect. Like, actually, on April... 2020, uh, April 9th of 2020, she extended the order closing garden centers and nurseries. So it wasn't just February in Michigan. It was actually springtime. Uh, but what she did is what she's referencing is something insane where you would go to like a Target or a department store and it would be open, but parts of it would be closed. Like the aisle with the seeds would be closed because that wasn't allowed. Nobody should outside gardening. Science. Right. It's like as if COVID spreads in the seed aisle, but not in the batteries aisle. It was always unhinged. And it's insane to me how they can laugh away the failures and inconsistencies of their literal tyrannical efforts as Haha, I guess it wasn't all completely logical. Like this is just atrocious. Keep in mind, this is the same governor who closed schools. Uh, who in allowed schools to be closed much longer than many other places and who actually had a policy similar to Andrew Cuomo of forcing sick patients into nursing homes, endangering populations. And then her administration uh, was incredibly uh, untransparent in, in um, misleading the public about the numbers of people that died as a result of that policy in nursing homes. And yet now she does these interviews and she's like, you know, in retrospect, I guess it all didn't make perfect sense. Actually, in retrospect, it was at all a disaster. It was a disgrace. It was a calamity. And it's crazy to me that they can just laugh this off. <laughs> Nobody needs retrospect. Everybody knew she was a tyrannical psychopath when she was doing it. Nothing she did. When she says it wasn't logical, ma'am, no, it was completely detached from any shred of scientific evidence to tell people they can't go garden while they're locked in their homes. That never made any sense. To say that people needed to be six feet away from each other and then they couldn't catch an airborne disease, that never made any sense. It's not that you just like lacked logic at the time. You went into a full dictatorship. You were grabbing power. And it was very transparent for everybody during the entirety of 2020 and 2021 that these things didn't make sense and that they had a lot more to do about these people just wanting to be able to centrally plan the lives of everyday Americans. And I cannot believe that she can sit there and laugh about what she did to people and the really serious consequences on many people's lives that will continue to have for years to come. And let's not forget that Gretchen Whitmer broke her own rules, I believe on multiple occasions, but at least on one occasion she was photographed and had to apologize because she was caught on camera uh, breaking her own COVID restrictions. So this is from uh, May of 2021 from The Guardian, a right-wing rag. Uh, the governor of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer, has apologized after she was caught on camera with a dozen other people who pushed tables together at a bar in East Lansing, thereby violating the state's COVID-19 restrictions. She was literally breaking the arbitrary rules she was putting on other people because those are the rules for the little people, not for the governor of Michigan and her friends. Of course not. And that shows you right then and there that she never thought there was an actual public health or safety component to what she was doing. If she actually thought that this was something that risked your life to do, then you wouldn't be risking your life to break your own rules. So you knew that this wasn't logical at the time. You knew this wasn't actually about keeping people safe. And I'm not having any of it. I don't want the revisionist history on this. We knew, we knew that these people would do this, that they'd come back in a couple of years and like, oops, we were just taking precautions. No, you weren't. You were not taking precautions. You were trying to seize power. And honestly, I just won't hear anything else of it. So let's move on to the next one. So, Hannah, are all white people racist? That's what Duh. one tick. Yeah, I guess. That's what <laughs> one TikToker had to say. Take a listen. I'm feeling spicy. So here's my hot take of the day. All white people are racist. Every single last one of them, all of them are racist. And I don't mean that to say like every single individual white person, if I talk to you, you would have some kind of racist ideology. I'm saying that as a white person, you uphold a system of racism by literally just being white. 
I believe if you're not spending your literal entire life dismantling racism, then you're contributing to its continuation. And people get so like, <gasps> whenever like I say like people are racist, like why is it such a big f***ing deal? Like, yes, you're racist. Like, okay, we've established that. Now what are you going to do to change it? Racism refers to power and race. If you are the powerful race in a society, then you're racist like i just don't understand why it's so taboo let's talk about it let's accept it so that we can work towards changing it we're never gonna get anywhere and people won't just acknowledge it in the first place so yikes give me your take on that i mean she was all over the place first <laughs> if you're white you are racist and there's nothing you can do about it and you need to dedicate every moment of your life to dismantling racism what does that look like that's not exactly defined but you need to be doing that every waking moment or you're racist but also you can't ever not be racist because if you're white you're racist so do all of that that's but it doesn't matter me. like she's she's basically saying if you're white you're racist no matter what so there's no difference then between like why not be racist that like yeah. it doesn't make sense you, it's like if you can't even it's not even possible for you to obtain a good status you're going to be bad no matter what you're not exactly encouraging people to not be racist you're kind of saying you're doomed either way exactly and then she's like let's just acknowledge it and talk about it so we can start getting things done ma'am you're never gonna get a thing done because you have no clue how to influence people or to motivate them to change or work with you and it's just I think this is a bogus mentality. I think it's idiotic. But even if, let's say, she's right and there's this huge problem with white people who have a lot of racism, if you if you genuinely want to change this, like this will be the last way you went about it. And I just think as a whole, the left has lost their leadership. You know, when you look back to people like Martin Luther King Jr. and even Malcolm X, who were really working to actually dismantle racism and fight real things, um, they their approach was nowhere near this. And that's why they were successful, because their approach was nowhere near this. But I, I wish that people who wanted to affect change would spend more time looking back at people who successfully actually fought evil and overcome it and take notes, because this is just divisive. This is, like you said, just going to incentivize people to actually be racist. And I, I've said for some time that was part of the uprising under Trump, where you did see some like real racism come out of the the quarters. And I think it's because you had the left telling people you're racist, you're racist, everything's racist for so long that a good portion of people were like, "F it, fine, I'm racist, I don't care," and like started wearing yeah. it loud and proud, you know? Or they get desensitized to it. It's like the boy who cried wolf. It's like if you call literally everyone racist, well, then when you actually, there is a racist person that people should know, like, don't listen to them, they're racist. Well, you've called everyone racist. So now they're not going to take your warning seriously yeah. or credibly. It's also just like deeply regressive to me to get back to this. You're bad by virtue of your skin color, by just existing. Like that is a racist. deeply perverse way to look at, at actually, humanity. It's actually racist. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Racism think. is about power. You can't be racist against black people or um, you can't be racist against white people because white people have power is what they say, but they just redefined the word uh, to suit their purposes. So also a lot of people don't have power. There are more poor white people in this country than there are poor black people just by sheer numbers. So you know. to say that if you're white, you have privilege, you have power. Sometimes that might be true, but a lot of the times it isn't. And again, those people who are already sort of on, you know, bottom rung, who are poor and they're white, and then they feel like they're getting kicked and being told they're racist just because they're white, that is not going to head anywhere pretty. I'm going to tell not you that. It's how you convince people. Call them names and tell them they're bad. And, and also, just she's like, why are people so mad about this? Just accept that you're all racist. Well, people <laughs> are mad about it because we all think being racist is a bad thing. We think it's evil, actually. And you want people to just be chill about it. Like, yeah, I'm racist, so what? Like, let's talk about it. Like, no! No. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been around this mentality some in real life, and I, I honestly feel a bit sorry for people, especially white people who are kind of trapped in it, where they're constantly, they feel like they have to apologize and bend over backwards. And it's like, they're actually the least racist people you ever meet. They're so consumed and concerned with it. that They really do spend like a solid portion of their time thinking about it and talking about it and just like self-flagrating themselves, trying to make up for it. And, and they have all this white guilt. And you even see it on TikTok in the comments sometimes where I saw this woman, just to give a quick example, going off about how she's a black woman, going off about how when people use the word brunette, they don't actually mean black women. They mean white men, women with brown hair. And this was a huge problem in her mind that needed to be discussed. Why? Can't tell you. But the number of white women in her comments apologizing, just falling over themselves like, I'm so sorry. I never thought about that. I never thought about how that would impact you. What? Like, it's pick me energy. 
it's it's just you need attention is what it is and you don't and i think it's a lot of people who want to feel like they're a part of something bigger i've noticed this for years right where you don't have the same levels of injustice to fight as people did in the 1960s or even the 1990s and they're desperate for a cause they're desperate to feel like they're you know doing something that makes a difference and they want to see themselves in this light as these like big activists who are making social change but they end up just grasping at straws and and looking really silly and ridiculous and not to say there's not big issues out there they could be fighting but the ones that they're picking are so minuscule but it makes them feel like they're doing something or accomplishing something if they post on instagram or comment on tiktok like they think that that's activism that's actually accomplishing something it's not it's not <laughs> Speaking of uh, white guilt, let's head to our next video where uh, a TikToker who does these man on the street interviews went around a college campus. I believe it was Georgetown and asked college students if they have white privilege. Here's what they said. Do you have white privilege? I believe everybody at Georgetown definitely does that is white. 100 percent. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think the fact that I don't need to think about my race, just going about my daily life is a sign of white privilege. Um, if we're white, subliminally, we have privilege over other minorities. Yes. So a lot of people like were angry about this. A lot of people respond with anger uh, on the right because this went viral, this clip. Uh, what was your gut reaction? I think if you are at Georgetown University as a student, you probably are privileged on its face. I think it's funny. I saw Glenn Greenwald point this out recently that when people talk about privilege, one thing they tend to leave out is class. And that's because a lot of the people pushing this, especially in the media, come from really wealthy backgrounds themselves. And this, like, they want to kind of hide that factor. And if anything, I think class is probably the biggest privilege, right? Being born into money and connections, it's always going to give you a leg up over other people. You're going to be treated better than other people. You're going to have access to more opportunities. You're not going to have to scrimp and save. You're probably not going to have to work as hard to be successful. The list goes on. Georgetown is a very expensive, very elite, um, basically Ivy League institution. So I think that most people there probably are. I also thought it was interesting, though. It almost feels like you and I tried to interview people like this at the University of Washington a few weeks ago. And we got a similar reaction where it sort of felt like most students had their script and they knew what they were supposed to say according to their talking points. And they were really weary of being caught on camera saying anything that might not be totally on track. And that's sort of my impression with these kids. It's not like they've thought super deeply about it. They're just regurgitating the talking points that they've been told probably by their professors or by other people on TikTok and the media. And I, I don't know. I mean, to be clear, I don't think that saying somebody has privilege because they're white is always incorrect. Like, of course, I as a white woman do not face things that black women have to face in this country. That is simply true. I don't have to have some of the hardships that they're up against. So um, in that way, I guess you could say I have some privilege, but I don't like it when we base it only on race because I think there are multiple factors that influence yeah. privilege and many are much more important than race. Yeah, I hate the way the left talks about white privilege where they make it sound like you're bad or you you have less right to an opinion or your opinion is illegitimate because of your white privilege. And they really blow the narrative out of proportion. But I think there's a grain of truth to it. I've just thought like, OK, my life, if I were uh black like everything else about my life were black there would be differences there would be challenges i would face potentially or things i would feel differently about uh for example i'd probably be much more nervous when i got pulled over by the police just being honest you'd also uh, probably be nervous to come out because being gay in the black community is a whole different yeah. struggle you know yeah absolutely i would have been more nervous um but so it's like a legit thing to discuss that there are privileged aspects of it I will also say, however, there are probably ways in which if I was black, I would have had more opportunities as uh, affirmative affirmative action, really, um, you know, being a white male. Um, just look at the SAT difference needed to get in to, to elite universities for a white male versus a black male. It's hundreds of points lower score that you need. Mm -hmm. And that's just a fact. So there are probably some privileges going in the other direction. I think it's all legitimate to discuss. Um, but it does it does feel to me a little bit like programming like yes like uh, i also <laughs> i i do hate the idea of like um privilege as one dimensional only about the identity politics none of the context because there are some black people who on net are much more privileged than white people mm -hmm. and vice versa there are, are a lot of white people who are more privileged than a lot of black people it's like all this stuff is complicated 
But this surface level identity politics, a uh, look at it is very reductive. And that's why I kind of reject that. But I don't want to do what some people on the right do and like just completely reject all of it, go to the opposite extreme, completely bury my head in the sand. No racism ever exists. I, America is perfect. No, there's no differences. Everyone has equal opportunity. I think those things are also obviously not true. Mm -hmm. I like that you bring up this reframing because I've often said this in my own personal life as a woman, right? Like, this is something that drives me nuts is they often will push this that I have less privilege because I'm a woman and I'm supposed to feel like a victim as a woman. And that's something I've always felt from the left. And it's a big reason why I've never been attracted to the left because I am no victim. Like I am a badass. So I've never identified with that mentality. And do I have some things that have happened to me or I've had to face as a woman that suck or that are unique to being a woman that a man would not have to deal with? Absolutely. But I also can point out numerous examples of things that have actually made me more privileged as a woman. Like I know that I've beaten out men for jobs who were more qualified than me because I was a woman and I was a really good look for that job, right? When I was working for a Second Amendment group right off college, I got that job because I was a woman. I didn't know that much about the law. I didn't know that much about public policy. I really didn't even know that much about guns. I was just pro-Second Amendment, but I was a cute young girl. And like, I looked really good for that group to hire. And I beat out men who were attorneys and lobbyists and had a lot more experience. I had one guy message me. And he's like, how did you get this job? I think we know how I got this job. Um, also, as a woman, like I paid for virtually nothing in my 20s. I flew on planes. I went to festivals. I got into backstage at award shows all for free i got drinks for free trips for free like i did not make much money in my 20s because i was working in the music business that pays crap but i lived the high life as a woman and i'm telling you i don't think any man would get to do that even if they were super attractive that's just not something that happens to men so there are always different ways of looking at privilege i think and we i think both sides make it way too one-dimensional and of course, as we've discussed, we both suffer terribly from pretty privilege. We do. Yeah, it's something that haunts us and we have to work really hard to overcome it. So give us money. All right. Well, now let's talk about our favorite teenage activist, uh, Greta Thunberg, who is the climate doomer uh, and kind of progressive champion. She has come under some scrutiny this week for deleting a 2018 tweet that did not age well. So on June 21st, 2018, Greta Thunberg tweeted a quote tweet of an article, uh, and the quote she tweeted was, a top climate scientist is warning that climate change will wipe out all of humanity unless we stop using fossil fuels over the next five years. Well, it's been five years. We haven't stopped using fossil fuels. And Last time I checked, I hadn't been wiped out yet. Checking in on you. Did you survive? Have you survived so far? I got a pulse. It's going good. So what to make of this? Um, I've noticed this with the climate activists. It's always just five more years. Like they are literally like a cult leader. That's like the end of times is coming. Jesus is coming back in 2021. Just kidding. Missed that a little bit. It's going to be Mayan thing. Remember that? The Mayan calendar, the apocalypse. Mayan calendar. Yes. That this is something that you can tell that they have cultish religious elements to this philosophy because I grew up in religion and there are so many overlaps to how they act and talk about things. It's so doomsday. It's always very extremist and everything's going to be dead and you're going to die and your kids are going to die unless you do this. And it's manipulative. It's very much based on fear mongering. It's not based on science whatsoever. And if they really did think that it was this impending, then maybe they'd start working with the right on things like nuclear energy and actually play ball. But it's not. It's about their uh, economic agenda at large. And so they're not going to play ball. They just want to keep threatening you and bullying you so that you give in and go along with their complete lunacy when it comes to these issues. And I think she's such a hack. I mean, Greta just I, 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 it's hard because I feel bad for anybody who gets puppeted out like a kid as she was. Her parents are really more responsible for this. You don't end up world famous and on the cover of all these magazines and as a top spokesperson on this issue if you don't have stage parents that are heavily working behind the scenes to put you out there. So I feel sorry for her in some context. I kind of think of her like a kid in show business. And a lot of times those kinds of kids I know from experience don't really get a lot of a very good education. They don't get a lot of exposure outside their bubbles. They're often very highly controlled behind the scenes. She's now an adult, so she has to start taking more responsibility for her positions and things she does. But anytime you and this is one thing I can't stand how both the left and right love to find kids to elevate their causes. I, it's very manipulative I and intellectually weird. dishonest. 
it's weird. I'm like, I don't trust any child for my public policy information. Why do you? Well, and especially with Greta, uh, she's been very open about the fact that she has uh, autism. And ben. so I, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, the, the autistic people have every right to an opinion, but then they hide behind. Now, you're, you're bullying an autistic child when you criticize yeah. her ideas. And to be fair, some people on the right have actually been nasty to her personally, which I don't agree with. But it's like they are very intentionally choosing like the most sympathetic possible messenger to hide a, a intellectually bankrupt message behind as kind of a shield for their ideas. Because even if you take the most charitable interpretation of what she claimed in this tweet, it's that not that we'd be wiped out in five years, but that if we didn't stop using fossil fuels within five years, then we're doomed eventually. That's not true. Like no scientists agree with that. Even the IPCC, the, the climate uh, panel from the United Nations, their worst case scenarios aren't extinction of humanity. There are lots of people being disrupted and dying and disasters and lots of things, but it's not extinction of the human race. It's just that has no basis in what scientists actually say. And unfortunately, you can see this with a lot of their predictions from this climate, because you and I are both people who care about climate change and who support free market solutions to the issue. Um, but the unfortunate reality is that they keep discrediting their green movement uh, like, go back and watch the movie An, in, uh, An Inconvenient Truth by Al Gore from Al the Gore. early 2000s. Or, um, it has aged so poorly. It made so many claims about what would have happened by now that haven't come true, yet was treated as gospel and used as this poetic warning to push for green. It's like they are addicted to making doomsday predictions that don't come true. And then they ask why nothing gets done. It's like, well, because you've done everything you could to discredit your movement with your doomsday exaggerated alarmist rhetoric. And, and the cost is to change their terminology even. I remember I had to watch that Al Gore movie my freshman year of college. It was mandated. I had to go to the screening and I was just rolling my eyes the entire time. But back then, it wasn't called climate change. They were talking about global warming, right? It was all about how the temperatures are going to keep rising. And then when that didn't happen, I actually think things were going the other direction, if I'm not mistaken. All of a sudden, they were like, well, actually, it's climate change that you should be worried about, not just global warming. It's, it's climate change as a whole. The climate is changing, and that's the concern. And that's stupid. The climate has always been changing, will always be changing. They don't ground their arguments in actual facts. So again, I think personally that as a Christian, we have a moral responsibility to take care of the earth. I care about these things. I think that we want to be good stewards of the resources that we have. And I think there are really smart free market ways to ensure that we are better about that. But the entire grift that they have on climate change is a Trojan horse. They, I don't think they actually care that much about the climate at all. If they did, they'd be doing more to try to rein in the big polluters, which are not, it's not the U.S., by the way. It's places like China. Uh, and I think that right now, what they want to do, what they're trying to force here in this country under the climate change umbrella is economic suicide. And it needs to be combated heavily. And if they're going to use people like Greta come out and puppet their message, then she's going to get attacked for saying stupid things. And if you don't want kids to get attacked, find better messengers or find a better message entirely. But I don't think that she gets to hide behind a shield permanently because she's been a child when she said some of this. And I think as a whole, she speaks for many people who are trying to push this agenda and they need to be made to confront their failures and their predictions that have been completely erroneous. All right. Well, I think that's a wrap on our quick kick segment. Let's move on to our mailbag. Up first, HB says, you two are so reasonable. I wish you were on a major TV network and rich, reached more people. Well, thank you. Um, though I actually think that if we're successful with what we want to do, we may be able to grow um, our online platforms to the point where we reach more than most TV programs, actually. But that obviously yeah. is not the case yet. Definitely appreciate the sentiment, but that is one thing people should know that Brad and I, why we form based politics, we really think that old mainstream media is dying. People increasingly don't get their news from TV. In fact, many of the top TV programs right now get far fewer viewers on average uh, per show than we would get on like a TikTok video. So I think that based politics is needed because new media is increasingly where people are going to be getting their information. And that's the space we want to try to operate on. Although we're always happy to take a major TV network show in the meantime, too. So yeah, if any of you would like there. to give us multi-billion dollar contracts with a studio and a team to do a show together, I think we could talk. We'd hear you we out. Yeah, we'd figure it out. Uh, Drummer Khan said, Ron DeSantis is a fake conservative if he refuses to completely cut Social Security, a FDR big government program. He values political power over consistency and conservative ideology. Now, I don't disagree with that sentiment on Ron DeSantis, but I'm not really familiar with where this comment is coming from. 
So I, DeSantis has said that he doesn't, I, I actually disagree with the sentiment. I think he's just being realistic, honestly. Like even some of our, uh, the most conservative, most based Republican lawmakers don't want to completely abolish social security because that's just not like an electable position to have. I mean, their, their voters would hate that. So I, I think people are just being politically pragmatic when they take kind of a nuanced view about reforming social security and saving it. It's like, You got to operate within the window of where we're at. And if you just take the most extreme positions on everything, you're not actually going to be able to achieve anything. Oh, but I meant I don't think he's a consistent conservative. Well, there's an argument to be had about that, but not because of his position on Social Security for me. But I I do think he's not. If you look at old conservative values of limited government, free markets, I do think he missteps a good bit. Um, Nothing to agree with. John says this program should be renamed Debased Politics, where sodomites and their slobbering socialist sycophants congregate to propagate perverted etiology pertaining to a decadent perception of all things they absurdly perceive as significant. Chat GPT wrote that. (laughs) (laughs) They were like, help me write the most convoluted, complicated sentence with words I definitely don't understand to attack a gay person. (laughs) Well, it's just weird because it's like, I mean, you can call me a sodomite if you want. I mean, I'm gay. That's not sure. But to say that we like this is where slobbering socialist sycophants get together to propagate their ideology is weird. Like you could say a lot of things about us, but to call us socialists is, is out of touch with reality. It's just completely antithetical to everything we say but most of half of what we do on this show is mock socialists and rebut their ideas (laughs) seriously i always say this and i think it remains true we deserve smarter haters because i think there's plenty you actually could fairly hate on me about but if you're going to come at me for being pretty or not pretty enough or whatever i think i'm beautiful so like that's not where it's at if you're gonna come at you for being gay when like you're openly gay (laughs) like Think deeper, guys. You're going to have to find something to actually attack us on that's or credible. coming at us for being socialist? Yeah. All right, like, then. Okay. I mean, I think if that's all you can attack us on, we're doing pretty good, honestly. <laughs> uh, Curious Camera said, you look like the Pete Davidson, Kim Kardashian baby that never happened. Is that towards me or you? <laughs> I think me. <laughs> but also, like... I'm not mad about that. Like Pete is not a great looking guy, but Kim is gorgeous. So yeah, I don't, I mean, Pete's not a bad looking guy. He gets way more women weird than looking. whoever wrote this comment. I guarantee you has not been with as many pretty women as Pete Davidson has. So yes, but is that because of his looks? I think he's got game and he, he's know. doing something right, but it can't be his looks. He's not exactly a 10. I don't, women think, women think about things differently like to us a 10 is not a six pack and like a chiseled chin like people think it is it's not brad pitt it really is more about personality and like other factors that you bring to the table i think so i've not met him but apparently he's doing something right somebody wrote hey brad can i ask you something i hope you don't take it as offensive is your nose bridge connecting to your forehead is so unique is it natural or result of a childhood injury please don't take as offensive I don't take it as offensive, uh, but it's not a result of any, I don't have any injury. I never broke my nose or anything. Um, yeah, I, that I know of could be like, of, of something, but I didn't have any major uh, injury. This is just how the good Lord made me. Studying your nose bridge now. Like, is it super unique? I don't know. <laughs> oh, well. Um, let's see. Paul Ladd said, you two are right up there with Regis and Kathy Lee and Hugh Downs and Barbara Walters. Oh, I That's love a compliment, that. compliment, right? Yeah. No, it is okay. because my mom used to watch Regis and Kathy Lee every single morning when I was a kid. So I loved them. They were a fantastic duo. I don't know the other duo. I know Barbara Walters, of course. I'm not familiar with this guy he's referencing, but thank you. I think that's a great compliment. All right. Okay. Let's move on to our hot takes. Mine this week is based on a hot drink. Um, I think Nespresso coffee is the hands down best coffee. I don't know how people drink anything else. I didn't drink it for a long time. I used to have a Keurig and people would always say to me, Keurigs taste like water. It's not very good coffee. And I thought they were wrong, but that's just because my taste buds had not uh, elevated yet. And I have had an espresso machine now for the past 
three or four years and I cannot stand other coffee anymore. And espresso is so rich and luxurious and foamy. And it's just, it, it's how coffee should be made. Also, bonus, I stumbled into an espresso store. The one downside about Nespresso is you have to order your pods. You can't just like walk into a store and buy an espresso. But I was at the mall the other day and I saw an espresso store. So I thought, let me go in there. And I'm talking to the guy and I'm kind of lamenting that there's no more pumpkin spice coffee, right? Because I love pumpkin spice coffee. And he's like, no, I have some in the back. So I have a friend in this espresso guy got loaded up on special edition pumpkin and peppermint coffee pods in March. Who's ever even heard of being able to do that? And it's just a great company. So team Nespresso all the way. So mm-hmm. my hot take, and I got dragged for this on Twitter. All And people, some people misconstrued what I'm saying. All I'm saying is this. I have a hard time viciously judging other countries and cultures where they eat dogs because I love dogs. I would never eat dogs. I think dogs are wonderful, but that's because of our culture of, you know, domestication of them. And I just don't see a world of moral difference between eating and killing chickens or rabbits or deer or many of the things, pigs and piglets or baby cows and for veal and dogs. I just don't see, like, and a lot of people who are meat eaters who are not vegetarians look at cultures where they eat dogs and are just revolted and think they're evil and vile. And I just, I can't, I would never do it, but I can't get there to morally judge them for that when we have factory farming. Like, I just can't. And that, a lot of people got mad about that take, but I, I still have yet to hear a persuasive argument. You know, I think a lot of Americans are not forced to confront the realities of our own food industry because it is so behind the scenes, because we no longer are that close to the farming industry. At least most of us are not. Our farming industry is heinous. It has many disgusting practices. It's something that I have morally struggled with for years about eating meat because I really do sort of have an ethical problem with it. You know, I'm a pro-life person. I'm a peaceful person. The thought of eating animals when I really sit back and think about it doesn't really vibe with me, but it is very hard to eat a healthy, well-balanced diet without meat, especially given my gluten allergy. Um, But I think that when you get into this, like the reason they get upset is because you're kind of for a minute forcing them to think about the own morality around what they eat. And that's not pleasant for people. They don't want to have to think about those things um, and they don't want to have to change their lifestyle. So I think that's why you got so much backlash, but you're not wrong. And I think if anything, if you're revolted by people eating dogs, it might make you want to think about your own premise and maybe try to reduce how much meat you eat because all animals have value. <laughs> like they're all wonderful, except for, you know, cockroaches. But anyways, that's I think that's where that comes from. And I yeah, I when you wrote it, I was like, Ugh, I don't like the fact that I eat meat. <laughs> that was my main take when I saw it. All right, guys, that's a wrap. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Leave us a comment. Leave us a review. We'll read it on the show. And until next week, stay based.